Well, Josh, it's been a bit since we talked about something weird. Yeah, I guess <laughs> I guess we were full up on weird movies that we wanted to actually say something about. Yeah. But celebration time has come. A movie that's been hard to see for a very long time. It's now on Tubi. Of course it's on Tubi. We're talking about <laughs> The Dark Backward from 1991. I don't know why I was looking at some, you know, how would you just get into Google searches and just like, man, I wonder if that's ever going to show up. Or the last time it was on DVD, which was 2007. Was yeah. It when the release was? The Dark Backward, yeah. I, it was on cable a fair amount. That's how I originally saw it. And then there was a VHS release. And then kind of late into the DVD era, it got a DVD release. And then that's been it. Yeah, it's kind of the... Not streaming anywhere mm -mm. until Tubi. Yeah, I saw that actually it popped up in the search with... Uh, and I went to the page and said, coming February 1st. I don't trust that. <laughs> that seems... It's wise not to trust Tubi. Right? Yeah. It seems weirdly optimistic, but sure enough, there it was. Yeah, I, well, I was mainly curious about uh, if it was like a new scan or if it was in HD. And it's hard to tell with Tubi because mm -hmm. everything is... The highest quality is 720. Yeah. So it is higher quality on Tubi than the old DVD release. It's not like a direct DVD rip. Yeah. Um, and it's hard to tell, like, because it's only 720. Like, I don't think it's a new scan, though. I don't think so. It doesn't I, look I, like it's... It looks like, like it's an older HD master that they probably made when they put out the original DVD. That's what I was figuring, um, yeah. So... Just kicked it up for... I'd seen that um, Alamo Drafthouse had been doing some screenings, like, within the last few months. Oh, okay. It's like, maybe that's what kind of, like, kicked somebody in licensing at Sony to be like, Oh, Doobie, you want this? We got this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Make 10 or 20 bucks off it. I don't know. It's just sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm still waiting for a new scan. But for the for this movie, it looking a little like kind of like ugly and grimy is, is kind of okay. It fits <laughs> fits the whole aesthetic. Yeah. This will fix you. Where did you first see it? I didn't actually see it until fairly recently. Mm. Um it would have been during the era where I had Netflix, but before they stopped doing the physical discs, because that would have been the only way I could get a hold of it. Yeah. So well, within the last six or seven years, probably, was the first time I actually sat down and watched it. Oh, okay. Um, but I had, again, also probably run across, run across it on cable. Well, that's for, for a while, I didn't know what it was. I saw it on cable late at night, and that was back in the days where the thing started. If you don't have like a TV guide handy, you might, won't even know what it is. Right. And what I vividly remember is the scene where now I know it's Bill Paxton, but as a kid, as I, I remember seeing a scene in some weird movie late at night where a garbage man is wandering through a dump and he finds the naked body of a corpse and starts molesting it. <laughs> and I was like, what is that movie? And then a couple years later, I saw it like from the start and that scene happened. I was oh. like, oh, it's this movie. <laughs> and it's Bill Paxton? Yeah. How did they get Bill Paxton to do this? Well, that's... And that's kind of the whole movie. It's, it's an anomaly of a movie because... It, uh, I remember the, old, the VHS had on the front like some critic blurb that said it's like Pink Flamingos meets Eraserhead. And I can see that. And Absolutely, it, yeah. Uh, along with the, like 50 other cult movies. It's kind of like a, a bunch of cult movies put into a blender mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. kind of makes it become its own thing. Yeah, on the surface you can definitely see the like with the casting you see kind of the Pink Flamingos influence and just combine that with like the, the world like set design of Eraserhead where it's just... It's, it's, so, it's so singular because in Eraserhead, it's, you know, it's obviously it's run down, it's, it's surreal. In The Dark Backward, it's it, gross would be the word that I would use. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's, Eraserhead is industrial. This is just like everything's covered in filth. Everybody's sweaty all the time. <laughs> it's the, it's so like sweaty. The only, you watch this movie and you can just like smell it. <laughs> you can smell the movie. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> it takes place. Yeah, I guess we'll, to set up the... the 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 movie it, it takes place in a world that's just covered in filth mm -hmm. and and one of the kind of what becomes one of the themes of the movie but the it starts with our main character played by Judd Nelson is a garbage man him and Bill Paxton they're like partners and Been there's friends a scene, since they were kids that, yeah they've known each other their whole lives and they there's a scene where they're working and they're at the back of the garbage truck it's going down this alley and there's just filth and garbage everywhere. And they're kind of pouring it into the back of the truck, but Not half really. of it just falls back out. Marty's crying. <laughs> Gus is just living his life. He, he just loves the, 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 the filth. 
Um, <laughs> so, but it's like, so they're like garbage men, but they're not doing a very good job. And it's like the whole thing is futile. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's kind of a theme of the movie yeah. is just like every, any, it, it's a very nihilistic movie. Yeah. Cause everything is futile. Mm-hmm. Uh, Judd Nelson plays Marty Malt, who's garbage man by day, aspiring stand up comedian by night. Sort of. Uh, he's, he's only barely aspiring. <laughs> well, that's, that's the thing. He's the exact opposite of what you want in a protagonist of a movie. <laughs> yes. Which is what makes him funny. Yeah, he's, um, he's very uh, co-starring in his own life kind of vibe through the whole thing. Yeah, he's, but he's also the only one with any ambition in yes. his life. Well, in a weird way. Because Bill Paxton... Well, Bill Paxton's ambition is just to ride his coattails. Yeah, but uh, so singular. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Paxton... Uh, he, he, well, Marty Mall is the worst comedian ever. His jokes are terrible. Half the time, they're not even, like, sensical. No, and those are the better ones. <laughs> <laughs> he takes off his toupee. The barber says, wait a sec. You wanted a haircut. You're completely bald. And the man goes, well, you're right. In that case, cut my ears off. And that's another thing, too, that, that makes the movie kind of hard to watch is uh, he's so bad. And I, you know, we've held auditions over the years for various projects we've worked on. And there are people that show up to these auditions where you're like, what are you even doing here? Yeah. They're so bad and in a way where they just seem completely oblivious, where it's like, you can't even read words off the scripts. Like, why are you here? I, and, and Marty is that, where he's like, why are you doing this? Yeah. You, you kind of want to root for him because he's the protagonist, I guess, but he's so bad. And I've seen so many people that are like that oblivious to just how bad they are. Man, I was going to say, like, <laughs> you put me in your movies. That's got to be bad. <laughs> I'm terrible. <laughs> Oh, you have no idea, Josh. Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's why that's an interesting, like, you, if, you, if you've ever, like, listened to or, re- or heard, read, like, like these performer, performers, like, when they start talking about their story, about, like, oh, the first time they got a laugh, or this or that, Marty doesn't ever have to seem to have hit that point, but he's still doing it. Which just goes to prove nobody can get a cab in this town. Uh, So Marty is an aspiring, quote-unquote, stand-up comedian, quote-unquote, and he's telling jokes, and Gus is trying to get him to, you know, the next level, and he's stressed out. He's got a girlfriend that kind of likes him, maybe. She doesn't seem to like much of anything or have many feelings until uh, the plot starts going. (laughs) Oh, oh my God! That's gross! And he's stressed out, and everything's terrible, and he starts, uh, there's a little, something looks like a bite. On the back of his neck, or the back of his kind of between his shoulder blades there, mm-hmm. and uh, starts growing. Grows in first into a little baby hand. Yep. And then a full blown arm. Full third arm. And sure enough, that's his ticket to success. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of nihilism, fucking, <laughs> the whole thing oh. hinges on okay, you're still a terrible comedian, you're still gonna tell your terrible jokes, but now you're a terrible comedian with an arm growing out of his back. <laughs> How can we exploit that? Not very well. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the concept. And in rewatching it, I was thinking about that, too. How It's, it's kind of like uh, pre, this predates like the reality TV show craze. Mm-hmm. And like, I don't know, what is it? Uh, honey Boo Boo. Like people with no talent that are, are exploited for something unique about them. Well, it also kind of harkens back to vaudeville sideshow stuff, too. Mm-hmm. I mean, which is driven home pretty clearly by the score. Yes, during, like, the score is very circusy. Yeah, and like during the talent show that they end up on, on when they finally get on TV, it's like it's definitely... What's the act before? Oh, it's just a guy who makes faces. Yeah, the man with a thousand faces. And that's another thing, too, is <laughs> Marty is, is an untalented comedian, but something that stuck out to me in rewatching it was how nobody is talented. No. <laughs> There's the talent show. What's his name? Twinkie Doodle. Yeah. Hosts this regional uh, uh, talent show on TV. And nobody, There's they bring out a, I guess a contortionist or a... He's kind of a gymnast. Kind of a gymnast, but he like pulls out a, a bedroom mattress. That's what he uses as his mat. His big thing is that he can put his arm, or put his legs behind his neck. <laughs> that's it. That's it. <laughs> like, that, that's the most talent we see out of anybody in the whole movie, really. Yeah. Uh, the, the rest of the people, like, that, because the... the Talent show is on screen at various points during the movie, and there's still that kind of like all the TVs are black and white, mm-hmm. so it's got kind of that 50s aesthetic going on there. Yeah. 
Um, and there, there's just no, it's loud sounds and people running around and nothing actually happening. And violence. And violence. At one point, Marty's mom switches to some animated thing. Oh, while he's on the show. While he's on the show, yeah. This is his big break, his first time on TV, and his mom just changes the channel to watch some, like, Tom and Jerry knockoff, but more violent. Was this before? <laughs> this would have been right around the same time that The Simpsons started. 91, sure. Because obviously Itchy and Scratchy is, you know animated characters causing violence to each other. So right. I was like, is this inspired by that, or is it just a coincidence that they came out around the same time? I mean, I it, it's, it's just taking the implied violence that's in, not even implied violence, lighter violence that's in Tom and Jerry cartoons. And, yeah, just pushing it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, what makes it weird, I mean, Marty, he, he's trying. He's trying to come up, with, come up with jokes. They get weirder. They don't get better. <laughs> <laughs> But Gus is just trying so hard, not necessarily for just to, just to write his coattails. That's certainly part of it. But he's he's trying to prop up his friend in a weird way. So he really, Gus is sort of the catalyst for everything else to happen. Your friend stinks. Marty Malk has to be the worst stand-up comic I have ever had the misfortune to see. What are you being so picky for? One night, he's uh, at Sid's. Well, Marty's performing, and he steps across the road with the coat check girl to go have a drink. Yeah, because he never actually watches Marty's routines. That's a, a reoccurring. <laughs> and he, even when he listens, he doesn't, like, pay attention or understand it. No. Tell him the one about the movie star and the podiatrist. Oh, this one really bowled him over. This movie star goes to see this podiatrist, right? You're right! What's a podiatrist? Who the hell knows? Um, he's just laughing because he thinks that you're, it's what you're supposed to do. Yeah. To support your friends. I sort of get the feeling, how, particularly on this last watch, I got get the feeling that maybe Marty didn't even want to be a comedian in the first place, and Gus just decided he was funny. Yeah, because he's, yeah, like I said, he's the worst protagonist ever. He's, he has no motivation, no uh, uh, drive. Yeah. It's always Gus pushing him, yeah. pushing him forward. Even when he, re like, he's starting to realize he's got something potentially special with the third arm and it gets them bookings. It doesn't keep them bookings. It doesn't make him funny, mm -hmm. which is something that I love about the movie is that every time he's on stage with the third arm, without, no matter what, nobody laughs because it's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, do I have a headache? But he still manages to like make these steps forward in his career, yeah. Thanks to uh, I guess just the, the the belief of Jackie Chrome, played wonderfully by Wayne Newton. <laughs> My God, if you want to see an amazing performance, Wayne Newton. He's great in this. He's so yeah. good. Talent is my business. Your friend has none. Now, if you'd like some free advice, shoot him and put him out of his misery. And that's another thing, harkening back to like what are the. The movie's sort of in its own weird way, like a love letter to this kind of like antiquated idea of show business. Oh you know, like yeah, the, you know, like we're, we're gonna make it and big. We're gonna get our big break on TV. And one of the the aspects of that is the the kind of sleazy cigar chomping like talent agent or producer or whatever. Yeah, and, and you kind of wonder by the '90s, like was that even a thing anymore? No, it wasn't. It was but like that's like the whole outmoded. movie has all these dated, like yeah. obviously it all looks very '50s and. So this old idea of yeah, uh, show business with the we're gonna get our break on TV and then we're gonna move to Hollywood. Right, and, and that's one. I think that's one of the reasons why Wayne Newton is so perfect because nobody knows showbiz like Wayne fucking Newton. Yeah. And what's with the guy on the accordion? What the hell does he keep running all around for? What's the matter? You don't know anything about comedy? It's called pacing. That slob. Oh my God, Mr. Vegas. Like he's known <laughs> those people his whole life at that point, probably. Mm -hmm. So he's able to just nail it so good. He's got the little pencil mustache. Well, he's, sometimes he has. Well, a, that's true. His drawn out mustache yeah. it changes shapes throughout the movie. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it's like it's it's like uh, his sweat has melted it off. Right, and he stands, but he stands out because he's the person who's sweating the least. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Because I want to say, like, all those years in Vegas, like, the dry heat, he probably just doesn't have the pores anymore. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but so Gus, by happenstance, gets Jackie Crumb to come see Marty, and Marty is, as usual, completely not funny. Mm -hmm. And uh, once Marty has grown the third arm, 
Gus is sure this is going to be the hook. He gets him back in, and they go back to Jackie Chrome's office, and he's got this other act that he loves <laughs> that is, was it human xylophone? Or? The, yeah, your human xylophone. <laughs> Again, with the also harkening back to kind of like old carnival, like you, have, you know, like the freak show. You have little people, you have the, the fat lady, obese women everywhere. All the, and then the music is very like circusy. Yeah. So yeah it all oh, this is kind of like old timey feel. Yeah. But the, the human xylophones, by the way, one of those, Tony Cox yep. the, from Bad Santa. Everybody knows him from Bad Santa, but. He's there. Down at the end. Whenever you have a group of little people in a movie, you can always guarantee that, that Tony Cox is going to be there. Likes to work. <laughs> I like it. Oh, what, what have we here? The old, <laughs> the old fake arm out of the back routine? Well, that's the funny thing. Is he's like, oh, the old arm out, fake arm out of the back routine. Apparently he's seen it a million times. As, as if that's a normal thing. <laughs> exactly. But that's the kind of the joke of the movie. Again, going along with everything feeling so futile is... It's their idea on how to capitalize on this is to have him just continuing doing his normal stand-up routine. Yeah. But just in between each joke, spin around and show that he has a third arm <laughs> growing out of his back. And even when it's not working, they're trying to workshop it. But there's this unwavering faith that like goes from <laughs> Gus somehow to Jackie. Mm -hmm. And even when things fall apart, Jackie's still like, he's he's upset, but he's not like, this was a fraud the whole time. I fucking hate you. You're terrible. Like, that turn doesn't come with him. Yeah, you would think that, get out of my office, you have that scene. But he's still, like, trying to make this work. Yeah. I mean, what we need here is a, is a gimmick. I thought my arm was the gimmick. Well, it is, but we need more of a gimmick. It was probably just a tough crowd. Like, you've got the cheap but effective set deck, but it's not, it doesn't look good. It's not, it's not supposed to look good. Well, it, like, looks it, grimy, makes it, yeah. it makes it a virtue, mm -hmm. but it looks, you know, like they didn't have money to spend on a lot of things. They spent probably most of the money on the arm, which does look good. Oh, yeah. When it, when it gets to, like, the baby hand's a little iffy, but when it gets to full size, like, it looks really great. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, you know, blended in with, with Judd Nelson's skin and everything. Like, it looks really good. Um, but you're down to, and the script is. <laughs> 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 like, like, there's definitely good stuff in it, but it's so nihilistic and so just like, if there was like a mirror opposite of like, it succeeds despite itself in like a positive way, because mm. like it feels like there are so many places it could go wrong and it just doesn't. Yeah, there's things where that could come across as like, I don't know, cruel, like all the, mm -hmm. the stuff with the obese women, but it just, it's so like boyishly juvenile in like a really innocent way. Yeah. I mean, the movie is gross, well. but... <laughs> <laughs> but, but like mean spirited or something like it doesn't really have that kind of vibe to it. Yeah, it really doesn't. And to me, by that point, to me, like those women, like you're kind of like, why isn't Gus that size? <laughs> <laughs> got, got, got the metabolism, I guess. Uh, yeah, like yeah. he should be. He's just <laughs> eating everything in his path. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't care what it is. No, okay. <laughs> that chicken's been in there for a while. That's okay. I, I don't care. I don't mind. You do see him like dry heave. There's a moment where Bill Paxton's thinking about. He's like. <laughs> I guess I had nothing else to cut to because it's just in the movie. But well, it, I guess it's kind of subtle, but... It's the kind of movie that could go bad and make you feel awful. Yeah. But it's the performances. The, the performances and the general, yeah, mainly Bill Paxson, that, that enthusiasm. Sam's hoedown. I ate a dog there once. Yeah. That keeps things moving forward. Yes, uh, but also, like, think about where Judd Nelson was at this point in his career. He's a big deal. Yeah. And I want to, like, I'm actually happy that, like, my first time back here after last time we were here, <laughs> saying some pretty mean things about Judd Nelson. In his terrible Santa Claus movie. Yeah. And... He, making money. It's fine. This, he didn't have to be doing this right then. He was just off of, like, uh, you know, like, he's still part of the Brat Pack, like, having some of his bigger roles. He's mainly known at that point for the Breakfast, well, he still is mainly known for the Breakfast Club, but yeah. especially then, like, kind of hot off that decade of playing sort of the hothead, you know, bad boy, tough guy. Had him a cushy role in the Transformers movie. Oh, you yeah. don't have to get dressed up for that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and, and he, I don't know how he got, like, got a hold of the script, but he was just like insistent, like he wants to do this. He well, was the one that came in. From what I understand, that's the reason the movie finally got made, is yeah. him, him attaching himself to it. Yeah. Because you look at this movie, uh, it's directed by, we'll talk about Adam Rifkin, the director. I want to talk about him in a bit, but, you know, young director, hadn't done a lot. He wrote this script when he was 19. Yeah. Which, and when you watch the movie, shows. it makes sense. <laughs> uh, but uh, 
yeah, and, and you know, you, you have all these big name people involved where you watch like Bill Paxton, James Caan, uh, Rob Lowe shows up at one point. Yeah. People that were all big deals, you know, not so much now, but at the time. Absolutely, um, at the time. And, and they're like, Bill Paxton is like eating dog food. And like, how did you, <laughs> James Caan is hilarious in his small role, but it's still like a weird, gross movie. Well, I, I never heard of this. Yeah, that's why you're not the doctor. It's just like an anomaly to have something yeah. that looks like this and has the tone of this to have all these big names in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just like completely baffling to me that it exists at all. That's part of it. And that's part of the charm overall is that when, if you're of a certain movie going persuasion as we are, you stumble across something like this and you're just like, treasure. Yeah. Like you're Bill Paxton in the junkyard, <laughs> opening up that lunchbox like, oh! So <laughs> Here's a sandwich. He's eating filth. The whole movie, he'll, he'll eat anything. Yep, I'll eat anything. I'll even eat bugs. <laughs> oh, man. And that's, that's Bill Paxton is the star of the movie. He is. When, he, when, when he passed he away, this was the first movie I thought of. Uh, this is the movie I most associate him with, specifically the, the scene towards the end of the movie, uh, right before he, we discover that Marty's arm has disappeared. But he, there's just a, a long kind of tracking shot that's just following him down this filthy alley. And he's just playing his accordion and he's like happy-go-lucky and, and kicking around, you know, newspapers and just dancing down this filthy alley. And like that's like the image that popped into my brain when I heard Bill Paxton passed away was was that moment in this movie. It's, it's so down to him too because like, talking about the tone of the movie overall and how it could be a, like just a bummer. And his role could have been just mean, bad. Well, like, that's the other tone is that way. he kind of is. But, he, but his, his, he's so like, he has this like childish enthusiasm yeah. about him. No, he plays it so down the line, like back and forth, like that whole scene where he comes over with the ladies and they're all drunk. Mm -hmm. This is after he's been like trying to gross them out by what he eats, <laughs> which is fantastic. <laughs> God, he's just, he's just making a whole meal out of that scene. Like, yeah. if not the, obviously the whole movie, but that scene in particular, he's just having a time. <laughs> and it's not like you want to see something gross or weird. It's neat. You want to see something really neat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's like, proud of this. He absolutely is. He's proud of being, I think Adam Rifkin has described him as a human cockroach. <laughs> Wait a second. You guys want to see something really neat? Well, come on. Well, but that's, he, that, that's it's real weird. What I wanted to talk about. Yeah, there's the, the scene where he's yeah, eating dog food and. And again, you got Bill Paxton in your movie, big, you know, real actor. And you have him putting like like sloppy dog food on his nipples and having these <laughs> obese women lick it off. So there's that scene, but then the scene after that, he, he he's like, "You want to see something really neat?" Because he wants to show off his friend's, you know, freakish mutation where he has an arm growing out of his back. So they go over to his apartment. And it's like three in the morning or whatever, and and this is the first time in the movie where the movie kind of calms down. There's no like crazy circus music and. And, and Bill Paxton's performance, he brings it down a notch for the first time in the movie because mm -hmm. he's just like yelling. Every scene he's in, he's just like shouting. <laughs> uh, and this is where I was like, oh, this is kind of an abusive relationship. He's kind of like uh, domineering of Marty. Oh, I see how it is. You ask a nope. favor of a friend and what do you get? A kick in the pants. And you call yourself a friend? Yeah, and that's the first time I like what you said. How he, he he's the one that like pushed him through for everything. Yeah, and you realize that's their nature, and you realize he's kind of manipulative. Where he's like, oh, absolutely. Don't you remember? I've done this for you. Mm -hmm. I've done this for you. Like, but there's a weird even in that l monologue. There, there's a, such a line writing thing. Of just like, I'm pushing you. I'm pushing you into doing this thing you don't want to do, and I've done all this for you. So that part's manipulative. But also, he's weirdly like trying to get Marty to be proud of himself through, like through that. See, that's that's my my. And then maybe this is the, because it was written by a 19-year-old, where that to me, the, the motivation of the characters are kind of muddled. Yes. Uh, and that's, that's the thing. It's like, I've never been sure, as funny as Bill Paxton is in the movie, what his motivation is. Yeah. Does he genuinely care about Marty? Or does he just think, if Marty gets, because he, he says it in the movie, he's like, when Marty gets rich, we all get rich. Yes. And he's going to take me along. Me too. When Marty gets rich, we all get rich. <laughs> But I think that's where the the real brilliance in the performance is. He's playing it. He's playing both sides of it, mm -hmm. basically at the same volume. Yeah. Like, and it you know it switches around a little bit here and there. But when it gets to the point at the end where, 
you know, after, after Marty stood up for Gus at the TV show, and it's just like, he won't go, he's not going to go to Hollywood without Gus, even though they don't want the accordion player. <laughs> and the tables turn. Mm. Marty doesn't, ha- you know, Gus, is, Gus has the opportunity to go to Hollywood without Marty. It would have been just as plausible for him to say, like, I'm going to Hollywood, as it would for him to say, I'm not going to go without my friend. Yeah. It, it really could have gone either way. I mean, it goes the way it goes, of course. The, the route he takes is, yeah, see you, Marty. I'm going to Hollywood. Of I don't course. need you anymore. Yeah. And that's, the again, the kind of nihilism, that sort of darker, uh, sad tone that the movie has underneath all, like, the freak show goofy does. Yeah. The, it, like, the fact that he it turns on him, it goes on. The, it's the overall tone, of course. Mm-hmm. But the performance could have been either way there, and it would have been satisfactory. Yeah. And that's amazing. Yeah. That, and um, Judd Nelson. At, he's, he's a young, handsome guy. And, you know, he obviously he's doing, like, you know, slicking his hair down, being extremely sweaty, wearing clothes that are too big for him. But even when we see him without his shirt, I was surprised how scrawny he was. Yeah. And I don't know I, if he lost weight for the role or if that's just how he was. I, I don't know that, but he still feels like he's, like, pulled into himself, like, physically. Like, he's playing it. Yeah. You know, doing, it like, the physicality of the role. Like, oh, yeah. He's always, like, kind of hunched over a yeah. little bit. Yeah. Even when he's panicking and, like, running around, he's still kind of, like, shuffling in this weird way. Yeah. It's like he can't, like, lift his arms too high. There's that part early on where uh, Gus is egging him on. And he's like, let's see you go big. And he's like. <laughs> big. Let's see you go big. <laughs> He has so little confidence in himself that he, he can't even, like, raise his arms. Particularly, like, the scene that really got the characterization for me with the both of them is when, just after the junkyard scene where he finds the rug, and he's excited because look at the craftsmanship. <laughs> <laughs> and they go to Gus's girlfriend's house, and Gus, a man of appetites, <laughs> is indulging. Yes. And he just comes barreling in. And Nicolette, his girlfriend, doesn't even acknowledge him. She's like, baby, yeah, blah, 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 blah. Hi, Nicolette. Yeah. <laughs> He's just back there in the hallway, just like. They've already forgot about Marty because they're ready to fuck. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's Bill Paxton, just, just pure id. Pure, exactly, <laughs> yes, yeah. For, See you, Marty. I got to fuck, and I got to fuck right now. For better and worse. <laughs> and that's even it, too. Like, at the whole, again, the scene, the drunk scene. Like, can I borrow your bed? Like, dude, come on. It was like, <laughs> it's not even in a separate room. It's no. like a studio apartment. No. <laughs> That's where you start to get past the surface, like Pink Flamingos meets Eraserhead. Along with, like, you get some, some Repo Man with, like, the corporate, like, face of whoever. Yeah. Whatever. Bl- Blump. Oh, Blumps. Blumps, yeah. yes. Uh, like, everything in the movie is owned by this company called Blumps. Which is always, I love when, when uh, everything gets replaced by one monolithic, like I was like, growing up with Pete and Pete where everything was Krebstar. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I love that. Some of the products in this too, it's like Blumps squeezable bacon, like yeah. some sort of liquid bacon. <laughs> yeah. Weasel roni, like rice a roni, I yep. guess, but with weasel meat? Sure. I don't know. When Gus is asking about the specials and uh, it's ham, it's like, it's a man-made kind? <laughs> The man-made ham. It's all blumps. And yeah, you see that logo throughout the whole movie. And uh, <laughs> I guess this we'll, we'll go into talking about Adam Rifkin here because uh, it's written and directed by Adam Rifkin. And blumps is a like become like a like an Easter egg in all of his movies. Okay. That you see that logo or that name in tons of stuff he's worked on. Oh, man. And it's the only way you would know that the same person made it because... He's a very, very interesting filmmaker Yeah. in that he's done just about everything at every budget level, uh, every genre. Uh, he's made, like, direct-to-video exploitation movies. He's done, like, studio, written studio, big studio movies for, like, Spielberg. Like, he wrote Small Soldiers. Right. And uh, I think kind of beloved family movie, Mouse Hunt. So he's worked on those. He did like the chase with Charlie Sheen, and which was the movie. one I loved. Man, yeah. I watched that one all the time. I rewatched it recently because I hadn't seen it in forever. I was like, this holds up. This is pretty good. Yeah, it's another good simple idea, which is just yeah. a movie length car chase essentially, and you do character stuff in there. Yeah, but he's made documentaries, like every possible thing you can do. And there's no—he's not like an auteur where you see like a, 
a Wes Anderson movie and you always know it's a Wes Anderson movie. You've probably seen stuff that Adam Rifkin has worked on and had no idea that they were connected in any way. Yeah, no, I forgot that he directed Detroit Rock City. Yeah, the kind of mid-budget studio comedy. Yeah. There's a Blump's uh, fast food restaurant in that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but even, yeah, not just like genre, but even like style-wise. Yeah. Like you look at this movie, and it is so thought out as far as the look of it. Uh, something that I also noticed in this rewatch is how nice the lighting is. Like it's, it's great. It's a really good-looking movie. Yeah, Grimey, no, I know, I, but, but I good. Know, I noticed it straight away, like even in the credits. Like they've got the the three different colors on the book. Yeah. It's like, look at that. That's just the, the something first, that could be the, simple. <laughs> the first time we see Jackie Chrome, he sits down, and there's like a dolly in, and there's this bright red light behind him. Yeah. Like lots of interesting use of like shadows and slats of light. So it has this distinct look, and then obviously everything's covered in filth. So that's the style of the movie. <laughs> so you see something like this, and you're like, oh, this is an interesting director. And you kind of feel like if you watch something else by him, you would see some sort of signature style. But then Detroit Rock City is very like animated and goofy with lots of like wide-angle lenses and yeah. split screen. It's a completely different style. Yeah. <laughs> he seems kind of like a Richard Linklater where he's just interested in doing as much... As he can. Yeah. Just, just like, I've never everything. tried that. He, yeah. He, uh, he, he's from Chicago. Um, he got onto the set of 16 Candles. John Hughes' 16 Candles as an extra when he was a little kid <laughs> just because he wanted to have the experience of being on a movie. And you see him throughout the movie. Oh, he's wow. an extra. And he's always wearing these, like, 80s, like, visor sunglasses. <laughs> There's tons of shots of him throughout wow. the movie okay. in the background. Uh, so yeah, did that and just like, I mean, the fact that he got this movie made, it just seems to be a lot of like determination and, and meeting the right people. It's, yeah, it seems and, like that And willingness too. to do, not just with this movie, but everything he's worked on, just like willingness to try whatever. Yeah, yeah, he seems like a kind of guy that like could ingratiate himself pretty well. I mean, on top of like getting James Caan to do this, which apparently he didn't particularly want to do, but he convinced him. <laughs> He's great at it. He wouldn't yeah. guess that he wouldn't want to do it. Absolutely not. <laughs> but like, he got Burt Reynolds to do that movie that he like like towards the end of his career, the, like the last movie star. The last movie was, star. Yeah. yeah, and like which that's something was, that turned out to be one of his last movies, which yeah. is kind of poetic. But. Yeah, and I, fe- I figured that was kind of a whole thing after like. Burt Reynolds and Boogie Nights, like he did not have a good time doing that and he was very displeased. And mm-hmm. so like, you figure like he wouldn't end up doing something like the last movie star. But even- Which again is different because that's like a kind of low budget drama, film festival type movie. Yeah, like, yeah. Nothing like the, the, the Dark Backward or Detroit Rock City. Or- <laughs> it's not, but in, in its way, it's the kind of thing where like you could see how the kid who made the Dark Backward like 30 years on maybe would like do something like that. Yeah. Without all the stuff in between. <laughs> um, but- even uh, his first movie, Never on Tuesday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which went viral a couple years ago it because did. of a Nicolas Cage scene. I've never seen the movie. How you doing? Is anybody hurt? No, everybody's fine. Did I get somebody left? I've only seen that scene. <laughs> but looking at that cast list, I mean, you've got... Um, I think Charlie Sheen's in that, too? Yeah, he's, he's a cameo. Judd Nelson is in it okay. as a cameo. Mm. It's like, so they knew each other, so maybe that's how that happened. Yeah. So there's connections there, too, with uh, Cla- what's her, Claudia... Uh, Claudia Christian. Claudia Christian. She's yeah. the star of that. She's and then, only in this movie briefly. <laughs> she's as, so good. <laughs> uh, James Conn's nurse. She's so funny, just for in like her brief moment. <laughs> it's an odd little lump. It's pretty big, though, huh? Or she yeah. uh, proposes Marty can't pay his hospital bill, so she just proposes sex, basically. Well, she's already, as soon as he's going into the appointment, she's just at him. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, okay, wow, all right. <laughs> There's like one cutaway to her. James Conn's like, uh, you know, looking at his back or whatever. There's just a cutaway to her, like, like ripping her fingernails off, yep. like biting her fingernails off. like. And she's playing, uh, He like, James Conn can't read the how much it costs or whatever. So yeah. She's too- <laughs> doing just little business and she's great and that's again going with the kind of like vaudeville like that feels oh, like yeah. a, their, their performances are obviously very exaggerated but yeah and she went on to be in everybody's favorite sci-fi tv show babylon 5 yeah yeah she's on that continuing to work with adam rifkin too she's in yep. uh uh the chase oh yeah that's right and she's in he did another random weird thing he did he did a movie that was like a found footage drama called look where it's all from the perspective of like security cam yeah. footage. Yeah, she in that? And then he ended up. Well, I don't know if she's in the movie, or, but she, he did a. He then ended up doing a season of an HBO series based on that. Okay. Uh, and she was on that. Nice. It's like another random thing, an HBO drama. Like. Yeah, what an interesting career he's had just doing all that. And this was like 
the first thing he ever wrote, right? You're 19. He wrote it when he was like, 19, went out to Hollywood and, and just pitched it around. Like, when you're 19, I can't even, like, wrap my head around the idea of trying to get, like, meetings with studio executives. And, when and you want to make what a normal movie. Yeah. <laughs> Less this thing. Yeah. Well, I watched an interview with him where he, he mentioned that. He's like, it's probably good that I made it so early because I wasn't influenced by anything. I had no experience in the studio system or, or working with producers or anything. And if I did, I probably wouldn't have even, like, because imagine, like, pitching this script to, like, a big movie star like Judd Nelson at the time. Yeah. Like, when you're young and naive, like, why not? And it's the kind of movie that could have ended in such a way that you would have just been pissed. And it's not a huge, like, everything's wonderful. No, everything's still fucking terrible. <laughs> he's, he's, he's a garbage man again. His girlfriend that worked at the diner that he was probably going to try and get back with, she's just gone. Yeah. Whatever ambitions he had have been crushed. Mm. But somehow he gets back on stage at SIDS. <laughs> and he's learned, instead of coming up with sticky jokes, although he still has sticky delivery, mm -hmm. he's learned that by telling personal stories, by finding his true voice, yeah. people actually find him funny. It eventually grew into a full-sized arm. <laughs> My best friend, Gus, said I was a weirdy. <laughs> yeah, that last shot where the camera's dollying back uh, and he's telling his jokes, and you can see it. It's a long shot, and it's a good performance by uh, Judd Nelson because you can see his confidence growing. Mm -hmm. Like, with each joke, he gets a little bit more of a reaction. Yeah, By the end, he looks like, the first time in the movie, he actually looks like he's enjoying telling jokes. <laughs> yeah. That's, but his drive for the whole movie is to be a comedian, but he always looks so nervous and miserable when he's doing it. For the briefest second, it's just like, oh, he could find actual confidence in, in himself, and that brings him happiness. Yeah. And so the movie will let you think, it, you know, feel at the end that that will actually still come for him, mm -hmm. which is great. Yeah. Even though he's still, the, the delivery still got some... <laughs> Some real shtick to it. Oh, sure. I love that. Those gave me the boots. <laughs> <laughs> My girlfriend dumped me. Gave me the boot. I guess she didn't like me always having the upper hand. <laughs> so, yeah, people have compared it to, you know, Eraserhead or Pink Flamingos. I never thought I'd say this, but it's not as sophisticated as a John Waters movie. Nope. Uh, it feels like something written by a young juvenile guy, which is fine. But then there's occasionally there'll be something clever, like, uh, again, going with the idea that this is this, like, dark world where nothing matters and gar there's still garbage men even though they don't accomplish anything. I noticed there's an establishing shot in Marty's apartment. There's a mouse trap. There's just a close-up of a mouse trap, and you see a mouse just crawl over it. It doesn't snap. It doesn't do anything. It's just a random cutaway. I was like, oh, that's pretty clever. Yeah. No, so there's these little moments of kind of wit like that in a, in a movie that is mostly, is, is fun and interesting and weird, but kind of witless. Yeah, it's got its <laughs> own little flavor to it. Like things like that are like the cutaway, or the, the, when they're going down the uh, alley for the first time throwing the garbage away, and there's just the one guy up in the high window just... Oh, just waving, yeah. Having a, I guess, having a great day watching the garbage men do their thing. Like, mm -hmm. even, yeah, even outside of what could be viewed as like overly quirky or like overly stylized mannered stuff, mm -hmm. which I like, I love. It's what makes the movie. But even outside of that, there's enough stuff sprinkled around. It's just like, this is, this is somebody that's got something they're, they're working at. Like it's not just, the, the, the making of the movie doesn't feel as nihilistic as the movie is. Yeah. yeah. 